right now recording this session. What this will allow us to do is share it with people who couldn't make it tonight or kind of come to the campaign a little bit later. Um, so just so you know, if you ask questions or whatever, that will be very helpful for people who cannot be here tonight because they will uh, be able to get the answers that they probably were wondering about too. Um, so don't hesitate to ask questions. Um, I've already mentioned muting yourself. Um, I've already mentioned, feel free to unmute yourself for questions. I'm gonna stop several times throughout um, the presentation to see if you have questions. Um, but again, feel free to interrupt. And then you can also use the chat for your questions. Um, there's a button kind of the bottom middle of your screen that'll open a chat window. Um, so feel free to use that. I'll try to keep an eye on the chat, but it's hard to do while I'm also presenting. So I'll check in on it sporadically. Um, so with that, let's talk about our plan for tonight. Um, I guess I should ask maybe if there's one person who would unmute themselves, I just want to confirm, are you seeing my slides? Like, do you see the agenda for tonight? Because sometimes Zoom is, Zoom is a problem. Yes, we can see the slides great. Okay, perfect. Thank you for that feedback. All right, well, so here's our agenda for tonight. I'm going to do a quick intro to Molly Rising because I think probably 85, 90% of you are new. So I just want to give you at least a little bit of information about the organization you'll be volunteering for. Um, but then we're going to dive right into the V to Molly campaign. And we're going to talk about why we're doing this, why you're going to be reading these stories. We'll talk a little bit about what stories to read, because I've had a lot of questions already about that. We're going to talk a little bit about how to actually do it, how to do the reading, how to record yourself, etc. And if you all want to humor me or if you're interested, I'll do a short demonstration so you can kind of see it in action. Um, and then we'll talk about next steps, like how to get signed up with your story um, and wrap up with any last questions. But again, I, I will pause for questions and feel free to interrupt. So that's our basic plan. Uh, in terms of Molly Rising, I do want you to have some understanding of, of who you're volunteering with. So I thought we'd do a quick why, how, and what on Molly Rising Foundation. You can also go to the website, of course, uh, to learn more because this is going to be a very uh, brief overview. But in a nutshell, uh, why Molly Rising exists, why we do the work we do, is that we really believe that everyone has the right to an education and that education changes people's lives for the better. And it changes individual people's lives for the better, but also whole communities, whole countries like Molly, and even really, you know, our whole world. We're all in this together at this point. I think that's abundantly clear. So a child getting an education in Molly makes my life a little bit better here in Utah, makes your life a little bit better wherever you are. Um, so we fundamentally believe that that's true. Uh, it's people here in, in the United States, it's people in Mali who believe that, and these days people all around the world um, who are involved with Mali Rising. So that's kind of the why. Uh, how, I think the most important thing to know about how we work is, especially if you're a volunteer, is to know that we try to make sure that all of our work is in partnership with people in the communities in Mali where we're working. So that means parents, it means village leaders, it means our students themselves, the children we work with, and of course teachers and principals and everyone involved. Um, it also means that we try to make sure that everything we do is driven by our local staff. So I'm the only US-based staff person and we have um, some great Malians who live in Mali and know Mali and are familiar with these small villages where we work who are really the frontline people doing the day-to-day -day work. And of course, we always try to make sure our work is also based in research and best practices and all those good things. Um, but fundamentally, we're, we're trying to make sure that we are, we're delivering what the local people say is needed or, or want to engage with. And then lastly, the what. Um, we started out uh, as an organization about 15 years ago focused just on building schools putting in middle schools, because that was a real gap in the education system in Mali. Uh, there still is a big need for primary schools, but there were more and more of those. And what we found was that after sixth grade, kids were being forced to drop out of school because there was no middle school within walking distance. So the villages where we work, kids would have faced a three or four or even six mile walk one way to school. 
And as a practical matter, that means they dropped out. Um, so we started partnering with uh, parents in these remote villages to build schools. But I think really importantly, we also decided it was important to stick around and make sure that we worked in that partnership to make sure the schools deliver on the promise of education. So a school is just a building if it doesn't have trained teachers and textbooks and you know health projects that can help uh, with hygiene and things. So we stick around to make sure that those schools actually are places where kids can, can really benefit from the promise of a quality education. So that's Molly Rising in a nutshell. Um, the uh, one area that I wanted to go just a touch deeper on is um, the project that your work on Read to Molly will plug into. So I mentioned, you know, we do a lot of different things in our schools your work will plug into what we call the book project. It's kind of a misnomer, um, but it's basically a project focused on making sure there's learning and teaching tools in the classrooms. Um, because what we find is many schools in Mali actually have zero textbooks. Um, sometimes even the teachers do not have textbooks, which makes teaching slightly challenging, as you can imagine. Um, and even where textbooks exist, three to six kids, sometimes 10, might be sharing one textbook. Um, so we are really focused on building the uh, stock of textbooks in our schools um, and also providing other learning materials. That's where the name's a little bit of a misnomer because things like your videos are really important teaching and learning tools that help make sure, again, that kids can really benefit from their time in the classroom. So that's the piece of work that your volunteering will really plug into. So um, before I move on, are there any questions just about Molly Rising or the book project that your um, efforts would be part of? Okay, hearing none, maybe save them up. Um, I wanna shift gears then and talk really about the Read to Molly campaign that you are here for today. And starting with why your work would, will really matter as part of this volunteer effort. So I've already kind of mentioned the lack of textbooks and other learning materials in our schools. Um, and this is a real problem because although there's very limited learning materials, there is not a limit to the seriousness of the curriculum that these kids are trying to work through. So there are eight core subjects that all of our middle school students have to focus on, and English is one of them, which is what we're going to be focused on with our stories. And our kids have a very different hurdle at the end of middle school than a United States student would have. So at the end of ninth grade, a young person has to pass a national graduation exam covering those eight subjects. And if they do not, they cannot continue on to high school or to many vocational programs. Um, so basically, if you, if you can't pass that exam, schools close to you going forward. And English is one of the important subjects on that exam. So having uh, very limited resources uh, in the classroom and then having this really serious hurdle at the end of their education is, is a hard mix for our kids. So, um, it, it makes your work pretty important to helping our kids get through their English classes and then get through that exam at the end. Right now in English lessons in schools in Mali, rote memorization is kind of a norm. Um, if you think about it, if you don't have a textbook or if you only have a book, uh, what you're probably doing in a language class is memorizing lists of vocabulary words or um, maybe conjugating verbs until you want to cry. That was kind of my experience when I learned a second language. Um, so it, there's very limited options for the students to actually engage with the language, maybe get a little interested or curious, or just actually see the language in action um, because they just don't have those kinds of resources or tools. In addition, when I talked to our teachers about this Read to Molly project, they were excited about Read to Molly specifically as an addition to this rote memorization um, for a couple of reasons. Uh, one is just that video itself 
is a rarity in our partner villages and in our schools. So this might be hard for us to get our heads around, but most of our villages um, do not have electricity. There might be a solar panel on your roof to charge a phone or something, but there's you know, no electricity, no internet, no YouTube. Uh, video is not the norm. Uh, TVs are even very, very rare. There's a few of our villages where one or two people might have a TV, where there actually is some access to power, but video is a rarity. So the teachers are excited because they feel like this will engage and excite their students um, and break up uh, these kind of more memorization-based lessons. In addition, I hadn't really thought of this, but the teachers pointed out that native English speakers are even more of a rarity than video. So having the kids be able to hear the language in its many forms. Uh, some of you have asked me about your accents. We have people who have English accents and different accents. Um, and the teachers are excited about that because you know, they don't have uh, any native speaking English uh, accent. Um, and it's a different skill for the kids to work on here and, and get an ear for. Um, so reading these stories is really going to help our teachers in several ways and help the kids um, and just make learning hopefully a little more fun and a little more engaging. So our goal for Read to Molly over the next few months, and this is just the first phase, we're going to continue this project, but our goal with your help is to have 50 stories read on video and over to our students by May 15th. So that's 55, 15, you can tell how my mind works. Um, and then your stories will become part of our virtual traveling library. Um, so I'm gonna stop and ask, is there anybody who wants to unmute themselves and share what might be an obvious question? I just wanna see if it's on anybody's mind. The fact that I've told you there's no electricity or internet in the villages. Is anyone wondering how your video will be shown in a classroom without electricity or internet? Yes, <laughs> I want to know. Okay, how, how is that possible? How is that possible? Thank you, Carmen. <laughs> um, well, in case anybody else was wondering, um, we have this is a new tool that we just uh, our pilot it started piloting last year. We call it a virtual traveling library. And what it actually is, is a projector, like you would have at a conference or in a classroom here pretty regularly, like a slideshow projector, um, with a thumb drive memory stick that has oodles of memory. And we load that memory stick up with all kinds of teaching tools, ranging from like a simple worksheet that a teacher could project on the wall and have the students, you know, fill out the, in their notebooks, uh, to maps. We have oodles of maps for the geography and history teachers. Um, two things like your videos. And the reason this virtual traveling library works is it has a battery and a solar panel charger that travels with it. So schools get the virtual traveling library for two weeks at a stretch and then it moves on to the next school, kind of cycles around. Um, at this point, we have two of these that are kind of making the rounds in our 25 schools. So each school gets it a couple times a year right now. So Carmen, did that answer your question? It sure does. <laughs> it took me years to think of this solution to our energy problem. So I'm pretty excited about it. Um, so we, we've been testing that out. That works really well. Your stories will become part of that and be used for years to come. Um, and the reason we want so many stories and why we'll keep adding them is we wanna have you know, stories at different levels because we have seventh, eighth and ninth graders. We want the teachers to be able to pick stories that they think their students will be excited or interested in, you know, maybe topically or that kind of thing. It's going to be great to have this array of options for the teachers and students to work with and a way to just kind of keep it fresh. So that's that. Um, quick overview of Read to Molly and um, our basic goal. Any questions on that? Sorry, my slides are going in the wrong direction there. So any questions on that? I'm checking the chat here real quick. Yeah, I don't see anything. In the, oh wait, maybe there's one in the chat. Hold on. 
I see what's inside. Oh, somebody says, that's so cool. Well, thank you, Rachel. Um, all right, well then, moving. I have a question. Oh, yes, who, go Sorry ahead. No, you're good. Um, but if we're part of a group, like I'm part of National Honor Society, mm -hmm. and um, I'm part of the committee, and so we were wondering if we could share with some of our members. Are we allowed to um, share it with others to also participate? Yes. One thing that as we get to picking stories will become clearer. I'd love to work with you just so that um, as you all select stories, uh, if you're selecting from our list, I'd like to know just so that we don't have like 20 people who end up doing the same book or story. Um, so we can talk about that and kind of how to coordinate it, but it would be great to get a group involved. And I think this would be a really fun project for that. Okay, thank you. Yeah, so let's follow up if you end up doing that just to coordinate, but I think we can make it work really smoothly. One question I have is that, what is the age range or the educational range of these? I mean, how are they basically fourth graders or eighth graders or only second grade level reading? What, where are they? We're going to talk about that a little bit in the next okay. section, Carmen, but it's a great question. And it's an inexact science is going to be the, the bottom line. So these are seventh, eighth, and ninth graders, but they are going to be like people who are picking up, well, for them, really a third language at that point in their in their education. So, wow. so it's going to be, you know, not what you would normally pick out maybe for a seventh, eighth, or ninth graders here. Um, in terms of content, because that vocabulary, et cetera, might be too advanced. But I'll talk about that a little bit more, Carmen. And then if I don't, you know, cover it sufficiently, you still have questions, let's talk about it more after this next section. Okay, thank you. Okay. All right, well then getting to that, that very topic, what stories? So already I've had people ask me some questions about this. Um, and there's three basic options for how you could pick a story to share. Um, so we're gonna walk through those and then I'll also talk a little bit about a web form I'm gonna share where you can tell me which one of these you wanna do and kind of make this all, all happen. So we'll, we'll get to the logistics of it as well. Um, before I talk about this, I wanna mention that when I say stories, that could mean like actual stories, you know, kind of uh, bedtime story kind of level stuff. It could also though mean, you know, short biographies, which I have an example of here I can share. It could even mean poems. Sometimes poems are really fun when you're learning a new language. They're kind of short and graspable. So you could read a couple poems. Um, so I'm using stories here as shorthand for what could be a kind of more diverse range of, of things that you pick from. Um, but your three basic options for selecting a story, and then I'll talk about how to select is you can pick from our list of stories. So I've put together a list that will be on a website that I'm gonna share with you at, at the end of the presentation um, that we think are appropriate, a good mix of stories. Um, so you could just pick from one of those, it's fine, it's great. Um, or you could say, I don't really care and ask me to just assign you a story and I will happily do that. And then the third option is you can nominate a story you love. So maybe, um, there was a story you loved as a kid that you think would be appropriate that you'd like to read, or maybe you're a parent and there's a story you read with your child that you think would be really fun to share. I really hope that some of you um, will want to do that. Um, in fact, if you have a story in mind, put it in the chat if you're if you want to share it. I just would be curious to see if anybody has kind of a story in mind you'd like to share. So um, do that while we're talking if you have one kind of on your mind. Um, but you can definitely do that and on the website, on the form I give you, there'll be a place for you to say you want to do that and then to share the title with me. The only thing we ask is that we do have to kind of do a quick review and make sure it's appropriate. So that's why we say nominate a story. Um, so just share the title. I'll check it out real quick and we'll get you on your way. Um, so those are going to be your three options. Um, and then I want to talk about like how we picked our list of suggested stories or um, kind of how you should think about picking out a story yourself if you want to nominate one. So um, I'm going to talk about the practicalities to consider and then kind of the spirit of the thing to consider. 
So first, the practicalities. Um, we're going to have to keep these videos short. So five, 10, maximum 15. So kind of on the outside, 15 minute videos. Um, so that is going to affect what, what stories you can pick. Um, the reason for that is twofold though. One, um, it'll really help our teachers because they'll be able to share your story and still do a lesson plan around it in the time they have. So the English lessons would normally be 50, maybe 60 minutes. So if we've got a 10 minute video, that still gives them some time to do some actual teaching around that story or the vocabulary or what have you. So that's one reason. The second is uh, it's hard to share big video files. If you do a two hour movie, um, it's gonna be really hard for us to be sending that around, uh, whether between you and me or getting it over to Molly. So we need these shorter video files um, to keep things kind of manageable. Um, so those are the two reasons we're shooting for keeping it short. If you wanna do a longer story, you can break it into pieces. Um, and I'd be happy to kind of help you think that through if you would like to. Um, but each video needs to be within that window. Um, the second thing to keep in mind is keep it relatively simple. Carmen, this kind of gets to what you're saying, um, your question. We don't have an exact reading level for our students. And in fact, they're going to be all over the place, which is why we want a spectrum of stories so the teachers can kind of judge themselves what's appropriate for their class. Um, and the seventh graders are gonna be really different than the ninth graders. But still do keep in mind when you're picking a story that you wanna keep it relatively simple. Um, when I was prepping for this, the word I came up with, I, I heard myself saying like, try not to have too esoteric of vocabulary. And then I thought, well, esoteric would be an example of a word that's probably <laughs> gonna be pretty challenging. Um, but that said, don't feel like you have to pick stories that are just like stories for babies with no challenging vocabulary because it can be a great um, lesson for the kids to look up those words or talk with the teacher about that and kind of push the envelope of vocabulary. Um, but, you know, do keep in mind that this is, you know, people who are working on this language as a second or really third language um, and try to direct it accordingly. And I'll show you some examples of stories that we think are appropriate that um, some of them will ring bells for you. Are and you I, saying, sorry, excuse me, this English will be their third language? Yes. So in Mali, there's students face a really big challenge. There are more than 40 local languages in the country. Mm. Most of our kids, um, most of them speak Bambara at home. So like with their family, they'd be speaking a language called Bambara, but the official language of the country is French. Oh. So our students, by the time they hit middle school are supposed to be functioning entirely in French in the classroom. And then English is added on top of that. So mm -hmm. it does function basically as a third language. This may sound like a stupid question, but why French? Do the French own that, that part of the world? It was colonized by the French. And okay, that only, answers it. Right. Only yeah. became independent in 1960. So there's, <clears throat> there's still a very big colonial footprint in the country. Okay. Um, I have a question. Sure. Why do you think they already know two languages, so why do you think we sh should teach them English? We don't necessarily think they should be taught English, but the national curriculum does. That's a really good question. Um, we are trying to help our students succeed in the Malian education system, um, which does require English language. But you're exactly right. It's not our place to say that anybody needs to learn English. Um, but as a practical matter, for example, the exam I was talking about at the beginning, it is required in the Malian education system. So does that, does that make sense? Yeah. Um, are they short of English teachers there or? No, uh, oh, sorry, go ahead. Or like, I'm, I'm just trying to visualize the education in Mali. So is it like the proper education? Do, do kids have um, access to school, other schools of, of, of good quality? 
or do the government care about the education there? I just I just want to know like why we are volunteering in Mali. Right. So Mali is one of, by pretty much every measure, one of the poorest countries in the world um, and, and struggles on a lot of measurements of kind of quality of life, like infant mortality and those kinds of things. The national government does invest in education. Um, these are actually like the schools that we work with. These are village and government schools. They're not Mali Rising schools and it's not Mali Rising curriculum. It is the government's curriculum. So the government is trying, um, but there's very limited resources in the country. Um, for example, I talked about textbooks. Uh, the government should be providing those and just is not. Um, so it's really, it's pretty complicated. I would say, you know, people, people as a whole in Mali really value education, um, but there's just not the resources to do the kind of job that we might expect or that the parents in Mali might hope for their, their children. Does that make sense? Does that help? Yes, thank you. Yeah. And in terms of you asked about a shortage of English teachers, there's not actually specifically, as I understand it, a short of, shortage of English teachers, but there is a perpetual shortage of teachers generally um, in the country. And a lot of the schools where we partner, it's a big problem because they're very remote. Um, so it's a really hard placement if you're a teacher. Um, you're kind of out far from your family, far from friends. Um, so there's a lot of turnover because it's a super hard job to be a teacher in one of these schools. So I take it that there is not uh, teachers within that village. Oh, like you mean people who grew up in the village and then stay in Correct. teach kind of thing? No, in Mali, the government assigns teachers and sends oh. them where they, it's kind of a centralized system. So it's, oh. it's fairly rare to have a local teacher, really. And a lot of teachers, again, are pretty far from their family because they've been sent far afield. Yeah. Are they, are they mostly Africans? Oh, they're, yeah, they're Malian. Almost, I don't, I don't think I've ever met a non-Malian. I'm sure they... There are people who've moved from other places to teach there, but they're they're generally Malian okay. um, teachers. You go through teaching school, um, you know, you have to be certified. Uh, so it is it's a professional, especially at the middle school level, a pretty professional career. Okay. Yeah. All right. Well, great. I'm loving the questions. Sometimes I just am like talking into the the blank space. So keep it up. Um, before we, before we uh, go too far down the well on the education system, but I'd be happy to do more of that in the Q&A. Um, just to finish out that, like how to pick stories or what stories, um, less about the practicalities here, more about the spirit. Um, it might go without saying, but if you're picking a story, avoid politics and religion. Think of it as like the equivalent of the Thanksgiving table if you celebrate Thanksgiving. Um, so let's just avoid those topics. And fun books are great, fun, funny, et cetera, but don't shy away from something that's meaningful as well. You know, something that is powerful, um, is powerful for, for everyone around the world. Um, so we don't have to be all serious and we don't have to be all silly. We're looking for a good mix. The most important thing that I want to get everyone to think about is that overall, we want these stories that we're telling to represent the whole world especially including representation for our students. So when I share our, the samples from our list, you'll see that we want to make sure we have girls and boys. We want to make sure we have the, the Malian students see themselves in the books, whether that's somebody from the region or somebody from Mali as a character or the author. Um, but we also, you know, know that kids are curious about the whole world. And so we want to see stories that represent, you know, people from all around the world or writers from all around the world. Um, but if you're picking a story, you know, think about, oh, how, you know, is there a story I know that would really represent something that these kids would either really relate to or um, be really curious about, you know, might be very different from their life, but would be a fun and um, kind of different representation of the world. And then I've had some questions about this. So picture books are great. Um, and if you want to show them as you read, that's wonderful, but it's not at all required. Um, so if you have the visual, awesome. If you don't, 
or if you don't feel comfortable working the, the pictures, don't worry about that. So here are a few examples from pulled from the list that I um, put together and that you'll see on the website. And I won't read through all these, but you'll see there's a mix um, of things from an actual West African kind of folktale uh, illustrated book, which is really fun, to the ever classic Cat in the Hat by Dr. Seuss. Uh, so of course in one, it might be a little more familiar to our students, the, the West African tale, but Cat in the Hat, although it's not at all familiar in a lot of ways, it's a great um, tool for basic English vocabulary and it's kind of fun and silly and engaging. So what we want is a mix of stories, um, kind of like the mix you see here. And you'll see too that some of these are a little more um, maybe advanced books and some of them are pretty basic like Goodnight Moon, but Goodnight Moon is a great again just basic vocabulary kind of story even though it's kind of childish. So any questions about stories and or these particular samples that that we've chosen and why we might think they're appropriate? Um, I have a quick question. Mm -hmm. Do you provide PDF copies of these books or yeah. We buy them? How does that work? How does that work? Great question. I'm going to talk about it a little bit more in a minute, but here's the short story. Uh, one, you can buy them, or some people are going to have books that they're using with their kids, or that I, I have books I've saved from my childhood. Um, so if you have a book, great, use that. You can buy it, um, and you can donate it afterwards if you're so inspired. We would love that because then we could um, provide it to the classrooms. Um, or you can use the library. We, I'm a big library person and I really encourage you to do it, especially if you're, you know, there's, you don't have a use for this book after. Um, if you're really stuck, I do have some um, things that I can send you, uh, that I can email you, um, but the library is just going to give you oodles more um, to choose for from than I will be able to provide you. So I'd really encourage the library. Does that, does that get to your question there? Yeah, that's perfect. Thank you. Okay. Okay. So any other questions just about the stories? They seem extremely elementary, but um, that's what's that's what's needed or that's that's where they are so that they can grasp more of the language. Correct. Correct. And some of these, I don't know if you're familiar with like uh, mangoes and monkey bread, some of these are not, you know, super basic. Now, Cat in the Hat and Goodnight Moon, those are really basic. That's part of giving the teachers that um, spectrum. But some of these are not so basic. And when you go to the full list, we also have like Nelson Mandela's compilation of uh, African folk tales. We do have some more um, sophisticated options on the list as well. Anything else on? Because isn't the idea that this is the launch of the program and that these are just 50 stories, but if it's successful, then I imagine as the kids grow and, you know, progress through the program, the stories themselves can also progress. Is that right? I love that. Yes. Um, just think if we're all getting together, like two or three years from now, the seventh graders who started with, you know, Dr. Seuss, we hopefully they'll be at a different level when they're in ninth grade and we'll be talking about, you know, maybe, ooh, how do we have a, you know, special tier for those ninth grade kids? So yeah, I love that. Um, and we're also, I was going to mention this, maybe I already forgot to mention it earlier, but um, it reminds me what we're going to do with these 50 stories is we're going to test run this for a couple months and get feedback from our teachers and students. And so, as you say, they might say even right out of the gate, this is good, but honestly, we need to, we need to ramp it up a little bit and then we can pick a whole other, you know, set of stories. Is this picture that we're seeing like a typical size of a classroom? There's that many students in a classroom? There are, and it's this many teenagers. I always tell people like when I'm talking about supporting our teachers, like they have a hundred teenagers sometimes in a classroom, like this is a hard wow. job. <laughs> you know? So yeah, this is not at all uncommon. I would say two thirds of our partner schools, probably two thirds are this crowded. We have some that are, are less, 
Um, but it's it's pretty packed in there in those classrooms. I just want to share a thing. It's not uncommon at all in developing countries. I know that America, a typical classroom only has like around 20 to 30 max students, but I come from Vietnam and a typical classroom that we have is like around 40 to 60 people. Uh -huh. And we still operate fine. So <laughs> it's not really uncommon. <laughs> That's good perspective. Yeah. Yeah. When I tell our teachers that our classes are 20, 25 kids, they they just look confused. <laughs> I will say our teachers have to run a tight ship. And I don't know if it's like that it, it, where you're from, but the, the class is pretty darn organized and they're pretty, they pay attention to that teacher. <laughs> so, um, so yeah, this is a typical, this is one of our classrooms and one of our teachers. All right, so any other questions before we move on to a little bit of more logistical stuff on this? All right, so um, I'm, in terms of how to read, I'm gonna talk about recording first, and then I'm gonna talk about the reading itself. I am going to send out as follow-up to tonight, a set of instructions that kind of do a one, two, three, like things to work through and think about as you're doing this. So this is kind of the highlights here that I wanna stress, but you will get this in writing and in a little more detail. Um, so first, how to record yourself. Um, there's two ways that I think are super easy. You might have others. Um, one is if you have a smartphone, which so many of us do these days, um, it's really easy to video yourself on your phone. You might need you know, some way to prop it up or to have a friend film you, but that can work really, really well and be you know, super easy. The second option, if you have access to Zoom, I have found that Zoom is great for this. You just get yourself into a meeting with nobody else and you uh, get it, start the meeting, you hit record, you read your book. Um, it works really great, particularly the audio seems to be really good on Zoom, on good quality recording. Um, you stop the recording at the end and then you can, you can download that file um, and have a really nice uh, audio and video combo. So uh, those are the two ways that I would recommend. You might have some other tool like Zoom or something else that you use. Whatever you wanna use is great. Um, in the instructions, I suggest that you read through your story, you know, kind of a couple times to get comfortable with it and make sure one of those times is a video run. Um, you want to do a test run on video just to make sure that you can kind of understand what the end product is going to look like, especially audio quality. So you might find you need to be closer to the microphone or you need to speak up more. These, you know, we've got kids who are trying to learn a new language. The last thing they need is problems with hearing you. <laughs> so that audio is going to be critical. Do a test run. Make sure you're happy with it before you send it in. And then just a reminder, five to 15 minutes. So that test run also will help you see, like, how long does it actually take when I do this? Um, so you might have to tweak things if you find you're going too long. Um, so that's just kind of like recording and then I'll talk about reading, but any questions on recording yourself? Okay, then the reading, um, this is in the instructions again, but we're gonna ask you to begin by introducing yourself. Uh, so just your first name and maybe if you're comfortable doing it, one sentence about you. Um, that's because I think our students will be super curious um, this will be kind of interesting to them. Uh, it's like meeting a stranger. So if you can just introduce yourself briefly, that would be great. Um, and don't overthink it. Like I say, it's one sentence, one fun fact about yourself or where you live or something like that. Um, and then do read the book's title and author. Um, that will help our teachers too if they're trying to connect, you know, making sure they understand what they're watching. And then the most important thing is read very clearly. So articulate as well as you can and slowly. Now, not slowly, but I'm going to recommend about three quarters speed or so. Um, this will just help with people who are learning the language again. Um, anybody's studied a foreign language and then, you know, thought you were doing okay and then go to speak with a native speaker. You find they're talking so fast, you get like one word out of 20 and it's a complete panic. 
Um, right. So you don't want to go so slow that it's painful. Three quarters or so. Uh, if you're a really fast talker, maybe knock it down to half speed, but three quarters or so. Um, you don't have to act out characters and voices in the book, but if you want to, go for it. <laughs> I know some like parents have a lot of uh, skills in this department, um, but if you're like me and, and find that harder, that's totally fine. Don't do it. Um, but do try to be a little animated. You know, uh, don't be monotone, maybe use your hand gestures a little bit. Um, this should be something that's a little fun uh, for the kids to engage with. Uh, so avoid the monotone if at all possible. Um, and if you're doing a picture book, you can show the pictures in the book or not. That again is up to you. I find um, it a little hard to coordinate, kind of reading and then showing the book and reading and showing the book. Um, and I find it really slows me down. Uh, but if you're comfortable doing it, I think the kids would be super interested in the pictures. Um, I found what I needed to do was I showed, I didn't show every picture. I would occasionally like break it up by showing a particularly cool picture kind of thing. But it's totally your call how you want to handle that. Um, so any questions about recording or how to read? I have a question. Mm -hmm. um, so if I'm, I feel like, are these videos going to be uploaded to the teachers sort of as their raw files or on the back end, will they be edited with like the script of the book? Cause I imagine some kids are going to be visual learners, right? So seeing us read a book mm -hmm. and hearing the audio is very helpful, but like, I'm pretty good with like making YouTube videos and using like editing software. So for me personally, I'm like, totally, I could scan the pages of the book and put the words along with my video or, or would I let you guys handle that? Or can I go like as fully into this as I want? Like <laughs> what level of production do you want to see? That is such a great question. And I love your enthusiasm and your skills. Um, so this is actually something we've been talking about. We do not have the capacity here to like uh, basically like put subtitles on all of these videos and do that, but um, but it would be useful. You're exactly right. So a couple things. One, if you want to do it on your own video, please do. We would love it. If you have those skills and you know and the time, that would be great. If you'd like to volunteer to help us do some of the other videos, we would adore that too. Just let me know. Um, and we have been talking to a few other people to see if we might be able to get some volunteer help to do that on the videos generally. Um, but right now, anyway, we don't have the capacity to do it on MOS kind of thing. Um, but if you want to do it for your own one, please do. And if you'd like to help with some of the others, please let me know. Does that make sense? Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. I think if there's like, Cause I mean, I'm not, I'm, I come from an acting background. So like I'm used to doing self tapes and like editing my videos to send to my agent. So like a lot of this seems like, oh, you're just doing a self tape of a, of a story to send. And I feel mm -hmm. like, I mean, I would gladly, I mean, do, I would gladly help do all that. So I guess I can email you afterwards, but um, yeah, that makes sense. Okay, great. Oh, I love that, Rachel. That's Rachel, right? Yep. Rachel. Okay. Mm -hmm. okay. Please do email me because I have several Rachels <laughs> on here, but I will try to track you down if not. Um, that would be wonderful. And yeah, I think it would help with different kinds of learning. I mean, there's lots of different things we could do with these videos over time as we expand out on this project. Um, but that would be that would be just great, at least to have some of them where that was an option, I think would be helpful. Um, all right, so I still have a little bit of miscellaneous stuff that I was going to share and then a link to um, uh, the website where you can kind of like start to dive in. But before we do that, would you all like me to do um, a demonstration? Of yes. Okay. <laughs> yeah, people, give a thumbs up on your uh, screen if you would like that. Okay, I'm seeing, I'm seeing some. All right. All right, so here comes the, the hard part. My computer is going to be ornery here. So I'm going to try to get my computer to behave and let me go to 
video. Let me see if I can get it to let me do that. I'm having some, oh, there we go. Hold on. Let me, yeah, I was afraid of this. Let me go to stop share and see. All right, so can you see me now? I'm still seeing the weird thing on my screen, but you all can see me, correct? Seeing some nodding. You all see me? Okay. And if, if I'm just a little tiny square, I think if you change it to speaker view, I should be front and center. Um, I should be bigger than the little square. But okay, so I am going to give you an example this is actually a book that we have um, that has many small uh, vignettes in it. It's a biography book. Um, so these are very short little biographies uh, that people can read. Um, so I am going to give you an example here. All right. So if I was doing this, I would start by saying, hi, my name is Merritt and I live in Utah in the United States. And I have two crazy dogs, a very fat cat, and I wish I had a pony. So that's just like a short, that's the short bio intro. And then I would say, okay, I'm gonna read uh, from a book called Black Heroes, 51 Inspiring People from Ancient Africa to Modern Day USA. And I'm gonna read you the story of Shaka Zulu. And then I'll show this story, the picture if you want to. So this is Shaka Zulu. So Shaka Zulu was a famous African warrior and king. He was one of the most influential rulers of the Zulu kingdom, which covered much of Southern Africa. Shaka Zulu was born in 1787. His father was a king of the Zulu nation and his mother was a princess, the daughter of a rival king. Shaka's parents were not supposed to have had a child together because they were from different clans. Shaka and his mother were sent away from his father's clan to live with his mothers. So is that enough to give you guys a sense? Probably could have even gone a little bit more slowly, but you don't want to go too slow. Um, and for this one, this is a very short one. So that was about, I would say a quarter, maybe a little less than a quarter of the story. So this would be a particularly short little vignette. So there's a little more room maybe to go slow. Um, any questions about that? I just felt that when you said uh, we need to talk slow, mm -hmm. I thought when you introduced yourself, you were very fast. Was I? See, I, I probably. So so, yeah, I, and I'm going, man, if I was trying to catch that language, I would may not even know who she was. <laughs> so I thought, but then once you started reading, you became slower. Well, see, that's good feedback. So remember to be slow, even when you're doing your introduction. I am, I am from the East Coast originally, so I am a fast talker, Carmen. So mm -hmm. I probably am a bad example. I get, it. <laughs> but, I get it, I get but it. But that's good, yeah. So think about that feedback of, you know, even when you're reading the title, even when you're reading the author, mm -hmm. think about your audience. So good feedback. Any questions about that? Now, this is a pretty serious piece, so it didn't give me a lot of room to be animated, but that's okay for me because I'm not, I don't have a background in acting, <laughs> um, but uh, you can decide how you want to work with your material and how much you want to throw into it. Like I said. All right, any more questions before we go back here? I'm going to go back to share. I had a quick question sure. about just the length of the videos. Mm -hmm. uh, I met. I noticed that you mentioned that we could do poetry pieces. Mm -hmm. so if we were to do a poetry piece and an introduction, and let's say that the video ran under five minutes, would that still be allowed? Or do you prefer for us to combine two poetry readings together to make it five minutes? Or what's just the, is it required for the videos to be five minutes minimum? That's a really good question. And I meant to cover that, so thank you. I, I think about five minutes is a good target, but it's okay if it's a little bit less than five minutes. I'd rather have them be less than five minutes than more than 15. Okay. Um, so my thought with poetry, like I was looking at, these are very silly poems, but I was looking at um, Where the Sidewalk Ends. I don't know if people still know that book. Um, 
but I was looking at that and I thought, you know, you could probably do three of those, kind of like a little group of those. And it probably, like you say, still would be less than five minutes, <laughs> um, but that would be okay. So if you were yeah. doing poems and it ends up being three or four, that I think that that will be fine. Again, it'll give our teachers options as they're thinking about how to fit this into their teaching. Okay, thank you. No, thank you, Paloma. All right, so now my computer's being really silly and I can't tell what you all are seeing. So I'm gonna try to get back. I just have one or two more slides before we set you all loose here. So are you all now seeing the slide with the three kids reading? Yes. Okay, good. Maybe we're back on track then. Um, all right, so I had a few miscellaneous things that didn't kind of fit into my other headings that I want to make sure you know. Uh, one, I'm going to, in just a minute here, put up the website and there's a frequently asked questions on there. It'll have a lot of the stuff we've covered, but there's probably some other things in there that we didn't get to. So you can always look at that. And then again, I've got these written instructions that I'm going to, as I eat dinner tonight, try to send out to you all. Um, we've already mentioned that if you do buy a book and you don't have any use for it, you could consider donating it, mailing it to us. We would love to um, have kind of a traveling book of box of books that goes around the schools um, that our teachers could use, you know, in conjunction with the videos. Um, and if you're, if you're of the means that you could do multiple copies, that would be really fun because the teacher could pass them out and have the students work with them while they're working with the video. But again, if you can't buy a book to read or find what you want at the library, do contact me and, and we can work something out. Oh, and then to send your videos, when I'm done, after I close out these slides, I'm going to show you because it, it might be the most confusing part of the whole project. Um, but we're going to have you upload your videos to a Dropbox folder. Um, some of you will have used Dropbox. Um, this will just really help because they're probably going to be too big um, for you to email or for me to receive. So I will show you. It's, it's in the instructions, but I was going to show it to you all as well. Um, so that's just a little wrap up. Um, so the next steps, I'm going to, as soon as we close out of this, uh, just put the web link. Uh, to get more information in the chat, I'll also send it in this follow-up email. Um, so that's going to be, that's going to allow you to say, yes, I want to read to Molly. So if you're inspired after this to give this a go, um, you want to go to that website and um, sign up and let me know what you're thinking about a story. Um, and then I'll also, for those of you who are new, there's a very quick volunteer forum that just lets us stay in touch with you. Um, so that will be linked in the email as well. And then um, lastly, if you decide this project isn't for you or you want to do even more, I wanted to let you know that we're going to have another one of these kinds of evenings on March 11th uh, focused on our flashcard campaign. And that's making English to French or French to English uh, flashcards for use by our students. So um, that's on the website. You can register for that. So any questions before we go to the website real quick? Um, I actually did have one question. So earlier you stated how you wanted to do about 50 books before May 15th. Was mm -hmm. that right? Mm -hmm. um, so I assume that that means that there could be a limit on the amount of books or videos that we can submit, or can we do more than um, the book that we're assigned or that we pick out? Um, you can always do more. I think, I think we can always use more. I mean, maybe not a thousand. I might get overwhelmed trying to load them onto these memory sticks. Um, but I, I would be happy if we exceeded that goal. Um, there is some coordination in terms of, I would like to, like we talked about earlier, kind of coordinate who's doing what stories, just so that we don't end up with a bunch of people doing the same story. So I don't <laughs> want you to feel like you wasted your time if we end up with too many duplicates. A little bit of duplication would probably be okay, but if we had 100 stories and 20 of them were the same book being read by different volunteers, that would be kind of a bummer for everybody. So did okay. I answer yeah. Did I answer what you were getting at there? Yes, ma'am, you did. Thank you okay. so much. <laughs> okay. um, uh, I have a question. Sure. How many schools are our resources getting out to? Uh, good question. So at this point, 25. And we're building our 26th right now. We just started construction 
on Tuesday, um, 26th. Um, so that's that those two libraries kind of rotate around those schools. So if we wanted to donate like hard copy books, you would imagine ideally it would be great for there to be two because are there, are there going to be two kits that are traveling around that have the same set of information? Ideally, but it would also, you know, what we might end up doing if we didn't have two of each is, you know, the teachers would just get the box they got and work with the tools that they had on that particular visit. And the next visit, it might be, you know, a different mix kind of thing. But you're right, ideally. Although I also hope in the future we'll have more of these virtual traveling libraries so that each school gets them for longer times. Um, so two for now would be great uh, for sure, but not required. Other questions? Are they going to be a spreadsheet? Is it going to be a spreadsheet that um, that we can sign up and claim like which book we are. <laughs> Very good. All right, well, let me, um, I'm going to share, I'm going to switch over to sharing. Let's see if my computer's going to let me do this. It's being very fussy tonight. Um, I'm going to try to share the actual website. So are you all seeing my browser now? I'm seeing you. Oh. Well, here, let me go back. Oh, screen sharing is stopped. All right. So I'm going to put the website with the FAQ, the Frequently Asked Questions, and the sign-up sheet in the chat right now. And then I'm also going to show it to you. Um, so this is the Read to Molly page on our website. Um, I put the address into the chat as well, if you want to copy it or whatever, and it'll come out in the email. Um, and it has some of the stuff we talked about. When you get there, you see the frequently asked questions. Here's the list of suggested book or story options if you want to work with that. Um, and then if you, I didn't mention this, if you're 18 or under, we do need to get a waiver from a parent or guardian just because we'll be using your image. We're not gonna blast it around the internet or anything, um, but we do wanna get a waiver if, um, if you're under 18. Um, but then you'll see there's a form here. And this says, has your three options that we talked about. You can select a book from the list that's there on the site and let me know the title in the comment field. You can say, you just want me to sign you one or you can nominate one that you want. And you can just put it in the comment field again. At this point, we're not gonna try to have a live spreadsheet keeping it up to date, but I will update the list it, once a book is taken. Um, from this list, I will update it. Um, so hopefully that's going to work here when we're a smaller group, and then we'll see if we need to go to something fancier. So you are going to send us this form to fill out? I'm going to send you this link to go to the website and fill it out. Oh, I got it. Okay. Yeah, so you can just get on there and it's, it's really quick. We only need your date of birth because we need to confirm who's over and under 18. And sure. It's, and then it's really about this. Let me know what you're thinking in terms of the story. Um, and then I'll get you guys the um, instructions as well. So any questions just about that or picking a book off the list? I will say if we have two people who really want to do the same story or book at this point, what I'm inclined to do is to allow you both to do it, but have one person do it like slow-mo and one person <laughs> do it at the three quarters pace and experiment with our teachers about if that's useful. Like if it's helpful for them to have the real slow version to start with and then a slightly speedier version to work with um, to advance the students. Um, so even if we have a little bit of duplication, I think that's going to be all right. Well, we are at the top of the hour, so anything else? Any other questions? I'm just curious, can we only give um, the book that we're reading like a hard copy or can we give like sort of other books that might be useful? Useful? That's a really interesting question. Now, Usually, I would say we cannot take um, mass book donations because the really challenging part is physically getting them to Molly. 
there's no postal service in Mali. There's no way to, to ship like we normally would do. Plus it's really expensive because books are so heavy. However, we are working right now on getting a little corner of a giant shipping container to go across the ocean and then across the roads to Mali. So um, if you're interested in doing that, email me because this might be a really great time for us to do a little bit of um, more intensive book gathering than we're normally able to do. Um, okay. Yeah, and, definitely. And one of my personal dreams is I would love it if our schools had, or at least if we could have a traveling actual library. Um, I'm a library person, so I would love to be able to provide more books if we could all work out the logistics. All right, thank you. Yeah. All right, well, I want to respect everyone's time. I really appreciate um, how engaged everybody was. It's much more fun when you ask questions. So thank you, thank you for that. Um, I'll be sending around this follow up uh, and we're going to work together and make this work. It is, you know, a new project. So thank you for your patience as we work out any bugs. But I'm really excited to, to do this with your help. So thanks again for, for being here tonight and for being willing to help. I have a question. Sure. Um, how soon do you need this? The, the actual video recordings? Yes, ma'am. You know, May 15th is our goal for the whole blo block. Oh, I see. Yeah, but we can start using them sooner. So, you know, if we start getting videos, you know, in the next week or two even, we can start adding them to the current um, virtual traveling library. Um, so if you're ready to go, go for it and, and we'll, we'll get it rolling sooner. Um, but for the 50, we're going to build up by May. Okay. Okay. I have a question. Sure. For the waiver, do you want us to just send that directly to your email? Oh, good question. Yeah, I should put that on there. I think that's probably easiest. Yeah. Um, I could have done a job for him, I guess. But yeah, just send it to my email if that's okay with you. Okay, thank you. You're welcome. Anything else? I have a question. Mm -hmm. So for, um, you said how they already had like two in their classrooms in use. Mm -hmm. um, so how does that work? Do you guys already have books, um, audio reading books on there or how is that? So the virtual traveling library right now um, has an array of things, but it does not have these video reading stories. So we're going to be adding this whole um, arm, this whole group to the library. Right now it has maps and worksheets and what else? There are some videos, um, music kind of stuff. So it has an assortment of things, but these are going to be the first stories that are added to it. Uh, okay. Yeah. I now I have a question. So, like, if I were to say to you, I want you to assign me a book. Mm -hmm. How do I get that book? You would either have to buy it or get it from the library. Okay. Yeah. Um, I'm trying to think. There's a few. Well, for example, if you, like this is what I'm going to do for people who can't find anything at the library and aren't in a position to buy books, which I totally understand. We have some resources like this that I can give you excerpts from, um, and I'll just email them to you. Um, but it won't be an actual book that we we're sending around. It'll be an email, you know, copy of the pages. That's a good question. Anything else? I'm happy to stay as long as there's questions. So if you gave me like, say, because I would go, I would go to the library and get mm -hmm. them. Mm -hmm. But I guess maybe you'd have to give me like three or four in case they didn't have them. That's a good point. Yeah. You or know? You, yeah. Or, or you can just check them out, um, like check it out online and say, no, Merit, they don't have that one. Um, but I'd be happy to give you maybe three. Three seems to be a magic number, right? And see if one of them pops up. Okay. A lot of these are pretty mainstream. Um, okay. Although some of the like West African folktale ones, maybe not. Yeah. That might be harder to track down. It's true. Right. Right. Yeah. Just so this might be helpful. There's an app called Scribed and people upload. There's like a 30 day free trial or it's like $9.99 a month. And it's sort of this like open source 
app where people load like sheet music and like PDFs for like class. I know people who are in school find a lot of their articles and like documents and things that they need. And there's audiobooks and there's like eBooks. So that might be a resource where you can find things. And if it's free for 30 days, you know, like you might as well just poke around and see if it's on there. It's yeah. another. Yeah. Mm-hmm. I've never heard of that. That's great. Scribed like ending in ED. Uh, yeah, I think the mm-hmm. app, it looks like, um, I think it's S C R I B D with no E. With no E. Okay. Mm. okay. And then you cool. just upload up, upload it. And then I got it there and just read it from, I guess you could read it from like, if you had like a tablet or an iPad where you could hold that as if it were a book or maybe have your computer like kind of off, off screen or next to your, if you're recording maybe with a, a phone, you can have your computer with the ebook in front of you. And then another thing like for recording it, I'm sure I would be happy to help with this. I don't know if it helps, but so you're not looking down reading the whole time like I'm sure you could probably film a longer video and then cut it down if it feels like you're having trouble reading off the screen. Does mm-hmm. that make sense? So you take a sentence at a time yeah, and just, and then read that sentence to the camera. And then after each sentence is read slowly, you know, eyes to the camera, like fully engaged afterwards in an editing program, you can edit out all the, the like dull okay. space in between. Cause mm-hmm. that may make for a, I don't know. Maybe that's too much work, but I'm, I'm just thinking of ways to make it easy on the person recording and for it to be a nice looking video at the end. Yeah. Got it. Yeah. Those are Thank great you. ideas. Those are great ideas. Um, if you're not that technically advanced though, don't worry. It's you can also do kind of like the mom reading the bedtime story or the dad where you look down and you look up. It, I, it will still be for our kids, you know, good production value but if you have those skills that's awesome there, there's two questions in the chat or two things in the chat one somebody a uh, kitty was asking i was thinking of reading vignettes from house on mango street would be fine if i read a couple in one recording i think that that would work i mean you might want to explain what you're doing just so that it's clear if there's a hop what's happening um but I think that could work. Um, and if you wanted to, you know, you could also do several videos and we could just make it clear to the teacher, like these are a chain, you know, you could do one, two, and three um, and present it that way. Um, so I think that could work. And then, oh, another resource, uh, Carmen and Rachel, we're talking about Scribed and then there's Gutenberg.org, which is free and has um, a large collection of books. Oh, Kitty says, none of the vignettes are connected. They're like little stories. That's perfect. Yeah, then I think that would work great, Kitty. Um, so again, you could do them kind of as a series in one video, or you could break them up into separate videos, whatever you think is going to work best for the time and the re- recipients. Um, another resource that you guys could use is called Libby, and it's an app, and you connect your library card to it if you mm-hmm. have one. Um, and so you punch in the number, and you can... A lot of the books they have at the library, they will have on the app, and you could read um, ebooks from there. Oh, great. Free. That's Libby. That's that's great. Okay, boy, I'm learning a bunch of fun stuff that I'm going to use. And then Juliana asks, "How do we upload the videos again?" So it will be in the instructions in writing, um, so you don't have to memorize this. But I will share my screen. Um, in the instructions, there'll be a link, and when you click on that link, you will see this um, page, and all it is is a Dropbox kind of link that lets you add files to a folder that I've set up. Um, so you can just click on this, or you can drag, you know, files if you've got it on your desktop, and it should just upload to Dropbox. If you have issues, let me know. Um, in the instructions, there will also be some tips on naming your file. Just to help me, I'm going to ask you to name it in a way that is um, identifiable so I can track you down if we have a question or issues, um, rather than having everything just be, you know, video one or something and not being able to connect it with you. So look at the instructions for a little bit of advice on that. Um, Oh, and somebody shared Overdrive. That's a great resource in the chat. Um, Overdrive Libby, yep. And then just a couple thanks as people um, 
are bowing out. All right, anything else before we wrap up for the evening? So if we have questions, we can just email you. Yes. Thank um, you. Yes, and I will I, I will warn you all, I am the only person here. Um, so sometimes it does take me a, you know, a day or two to, to get back to everybody, but I'm I'm really excited that you're excited about this. So I will be I will be here. I'm happy to help. Um, but uh, sometimes it does take me a day or so to respond. Um, but, but please do email me if you end up with questions. Okay. All right. Anybody else before we say good night? All right. Well, thank you again. I'm really excited to launch this with everyone. And I thank you for your time tonight. Thank, thank, you. You. thank 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 you.